Uh, yes, dear audience, so, so I'll, I'll continue a bit, bit where, where uh, Mika left us off. And uh, I'll, I'll also focus on the EPO a bit because the EPO has made, made let's say, so many rules in this area. But then I'll also look at, at the U.S. And, and at the end I'll provide a bit of comparison to some Asian countries. But I'll especially focus from a, let's say, patent practitioner's point of view. So, so what should you consider already when you, you know, when you look at an AI-related invention? And, you know, what to keep in mind when thinking, you know, could I get a patent for this? And then if you go forward and actually apply for a patent, then, you know, what should you keep in mind and what should you get into your patent application? Uh, this was already discussed earlier, but I, I just kind of a simplified a bit of maybe what is artificial intelligence. So typically, you know, you'll have a you'll have an input and you'll have an output, and in between, you know, often you'll have some kind of a training functions, and and then you'll have uh, machine learning algorithms. And that's maybe a, a simplification, as, uh, as we saw earlier from rules. You can have other types of uh, logics as, as, as well. Then we already discussed some typical application areas where you can use AI, like you know, image and speech processing, simulators. You know, in finance, you can make market analysis. In healthcare, there's foreseen that you know you can pretty soon maybe replace doctors in, in making you know predictions and medical analysis you know, et cetera. But okay, I'll, I'll jump to the, the kind of a patentability aspect because that's, that's uh, kind of, a, for me, the, the interesting part. And Mika already discussed that. We, I'll discuss the EPO first and, and discuss this kind of a two-hurdle approach that the EPO is using. So first, you know, they'll look at whether the invention concerns excluded matter. And, and as Mika showed, that's the Article 52.2. And if, if basically all the elements in your claim go into the excluded area, then, you know, the, the, the invention is excluded. But you can have a mix of technical and non-technical uh, features. And specially, specifically, those, I think, those kind of listed here are typically considered by examiners as non-technical features. And so for AI, the, the challenges are, as, as Mika stated, so... Math exclusion of mathematical methods, also exclusion of, of uh, programs for, for computers, as well as, you know, often we go maybe into the area of, of whether it's, it, they mention relates to mental act or, or, you know, method of, of doing business. But yeah, so this is an easy hurdle to overcome, you know, you can easily get in technical elements. But the more difficult one is, is the second hurdle, and that's what Mika also discussed, how inventive step is addressed. And, and that's the fact that only features that contribute to the technical character of the invention are used for assessing inventive step. So all the non-technical features are, are basically omitted in assessing inventive step, and, and this, is, this is often a challenge. And, and what examiners do, I'll, I'll show you an example, is, is that they actually often they overstrike features from the claim that they feel are non-technical. Or sometimes I've seen they do it the opposite. They overstrike the technical features just to show that what you have left is, you know, some kind of a, a mental act, for example. Um, I took an example from a real case, but here actually the, the, the text that has been always struck is, is my, my, my uh, markings here. So to take a Finnish company, so this is a Nokia uh, decision. And, and this is not AI related, so more, more let's say, mental act or, or method of doing business related. But here, uh, this is concerned, you know, method of facilitating shopping with a mobile wireless communications device. And, and what I have uh, struck over here, they didn't do this at the board or explanation, but this is my interpretation of what the board said, what they said was not technical. And, and you see, once you start doing this, when you strike over, you know, all these priority of purchase goods and services, 
etc., then you're only left here with, you know, communicating from the mobile wireless communications device with, you know, at least one server. And then you say that, uh, you know, and that this is by a user on or before the user shops at the shopping location. And then, you know, the at least server in response to information stored therein regarding vendors located at the shopping location and the goods and services offered by the vendors, causing at least an identification to be transferred, you know, to the mobile wireless device. And then the mobile wireless device providing the user an identification. So you see, one, once you take all this apart, you're left with basically kind of a <coughs> receiving an identification and, or sending an identification and, and then showing an identification. So, of course, you, you will not... You will be very difficult to convince anybody that there would be inventive step after this. And, and this is the challenge we, we face. And my take is that very often when you see this being done, then what, what you have to look at are is that did the examiner actually overstrike features that do contribute to the, you know, do provide a technical contribution. Because if you start from this, you've already lost, lost the game. Uh, but but to, without reading the claim going further, so, so in, into this case, so what, what uh, they discussed here is that the application acknowledges systems that show on a mobile device available products as a shopper moves around in a shop. So that was, that was the principal idea here. And the shopper enters, you know, two or more desired goods or services into, you know, his or her mobile device before going shopping. And the device then displays a shopping itinerary, <laughs> I can't even pronounce it, showing an order or let's say sequence in which a shopper can visit a group of vendors to obtain them. And then this, this itinerary <coughs> is a function of a user profile, so, you know, for example, requiring the shortest distance between vendors or, you know, the cheapest purchase price. And in the board's view, all, you know, the overall effect of the method, namely, you know, to produce this ordered list of shops is not technical. <laughs> and, and the appellant, so not yet tried to argue, well, that actually the, the difference is, in, you know, compared to prior art, is that this, this implied an actual problem of lo logistics which was not a business method. But, well, the board said, well, that the logistic or navigation system that actually involves navigation to a particular place might have some technical element. But they didn't feel, you know, this was the case here. So there's a more, it, it involves standard human behavioral concepts. So in summary, the board said that, well, Technical effect may arise from either provision of data about a technical process or then provision of data applied directly in a technical process. So, so and I, I think that even though this is related to business method, this will be relevant to AI because often still EPO and other offices, they relate to these, you could say, old-fashioned technical processes. And, and, and I, I think when we go to AI, I'll, I'll come to this a bit. Maybe we'll actually have new kind of technical issues that are faced when, when dealing with AI. And, and the challenge is how, how to get examiners maybe, maybe to realize that. Anyway, this, so this, this patent was, you know, was rejected because the board, board felt that there was really nothing technical here, more more, you know, uh, mental act. Anyway, as Mika also said, you know, the EPO has now made, or let's say, added AI examples into the guidelines, which I believe is, is helpful. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's, uh, whether it helps in getting patents, but at least you have some guidelines to look at, and, uh, you know, as of, as of uh, November last year. And so, you know, what they state is that artificial intelligence, machine learning are based on computational models and algorithms, you know, for classification, etc. And they say that these, you know, such computational models and algorithms are per se of an abstract mathematical nature. 
and thus excluded subject matter. And in view of what I showed of the example where you strike over the non-technical elements, the following is very relevant. So as Mika also had in his slides, so they said that expressions such as support vector machine, reasoning engine, or neural network are considered to not have technical character. This is, at least for me as a practitioner, a problem because I would hope that you know, the, the uh, neural network would be regarded as a technical element because a lot of the AI-related problems will somehow involve a neural network. So, so this means that we are faced with somehow getting in, you could say, these traditional technical uh, problems in, in, into the invention or into the claim, as I'll, I'll, I'll come to. And Mick already went through this, so they've also given examples, so classifying documents solely in respect of their uh, textual content was, you know, is, is not technical and just excluded. And also, it's classifying of abstract data records, you know, they consider is, is per se not technical and excluded. But they're given some examples, as, as Mick already show, showed here, what would be the positive impact of what, what, you know, what they would consider uh, contributing uh, or, or providing a technical contribution. And one was this, you know, using a neural network in heart beating, or uh, sorry, in heart monitoring apparatus for the purpose of identifying irregular heartbeats. Uh, they further say that, you know, classifying digital images or video audio speech based on low level features are further typical technical applications. So those, you know, again, could be patentable. And also they say, so they, they I think, hint that you could maybe have more patentability in, in maybe the training functions than the, the, you could say, the machine learning functions because they say that the uh, steps of generating <coughs> the training set and training the classifier may also contribute to a technical character of the invention if they support achieving the technical purpose. So there's some hints to maybe what to, to look at in, in uh, getting, getting your patent allowed. There's also a section on, on mathematical methods that was kind of updated last November and that's relevant in that they, I think, helpful in that they say that uh, math math mathematical method can contribute to a technical character or invention if the claim is limited to a specific technical application of the mathematical method. So that's helpful. So not all, you could say, mathematical methods would be excluded. And they say that in, case, in this case, the mathematical method is capable of distinguishing over the prior art when inventive step is examined by EPO. So again, that's positive that in this case, the mathematical method would be considered a technical feature, just not, you know, not overstruck, as, as in my example. And, and you know, so examples could be you know, audio processing or encryption, decryption. But what they do make clear is that the technical purpose must be a specific one. So, you know, for example, related to audio processing, it cannot be a generic such as controlling a technical system. In that case, uh, you know, you would not, not get a patent. So looking at uh, the technical problem, because this, this whether it's a technical, it has a technical contribution relates to the fact, is it, does the invention solve a technical problem by technical means? And, you know, the, the classical examples of computer-implemented inventions are, are, you know, if you save resources, save, you know, computer memory, processing capacity, etc., or, you, you know, you improve accuracy of something, you know, simulation, prediction, etc., or you improve security. These are traditional technical kind of benefits and problems. If, if your invention solves this, Yes, you, you'll get a patent, no problem. But I think what, what we face in AI is the fact that AI will probably include new kinds of problems. And, and, and this will then be the challenge, how maybe how to get the message through that this, these are also kind of technical problems. So one could be, you know, generating a rationale for an AI decision, you know, for example, how something is implemented in cooperation with a neural network. You know, that could be a, 
a new kind of a technical solution, how to do it. Or implementing the right to be forgotten. You know, there's a lot of discussion like on GDPR and, you know, how if you want to remove your personal data, if, if your personal data in this complex neural network, how do you actually remove it, you know, without someone having to do it in an administrative way, then that solution could actually be a, you know, in my view, solution to a technical problem. Or as uh, Marco showed, the, the, uh, the European Parliament's resolution on, on accountability, you know, this, this could be a big issue in the future when you have autonomous vehicles. If there is a collision, how do you determine who is accountable? So there could, the invention could relate to, you know, how to store data of everything what happened in a tamper-proof manner. And of course, that, that is kind of an, an AI-related problem, or a, and, and, but, but the solution could well be a, you know, solution to a technical problem. And then we could have AI ethics related problems, you know, how in, in face recognition, how can you exclude uh, that certain ethnic backgrounds are, are somehow or biasing, affecting the end result. So in any case, in my view, if, if the solution to these problems is more than, you know, just abstract statistics, then there's potential that you actually are facing a technical solution. And thus, thus you know, you have a good chance of getting a patent. So in that sense, when, when you discuss with in inventors, you should try to find out what are, you know, what is it that the invention solves, and, and maybe that's your key in, in argumenting that you actually are solving a technical problem and, and by technical means. All right, jumping uh, quickly to the U.S. As, as Mika said, U.S. Using this, uses this Alice test, two-step test, so, you know, it's the claim directed to, and especially an abstract idea, sorry, and if yes, you know, does the claim lead to something significantly more than, than just the abstract idea, basically? And if it does, then, then, you know, then you should get a patent, and if not, then not. And going forward, the, the USPTO just recently published new guidelines on this, beginning of January, how, how to address this. So, so they, they, they come a bit closer, and at least they have listed made a list of what, are, what is considered an abstract idea. I think this is a bit of help, bit helpful. I'm not going to go through all of this, but, you know, mathematical concept, methods of organizing human activity and, and some mental processes. And what they've done here is they've kind of added a, an other kind of two-prong inquiry in, in this two-step Alice test, where the first prong is to, you know, consider whether claim concern some of these ineligible concepts that I showed on the previous slide. So this list of abstract ideas. And then, you know, if it does, then the examiner must consider whether the ineligible concept is integrated into practical application. I think that's helpful. So now you have to find some kind of a practical application. If you do, then, then again, you have a better chance of, or, or it's a good argument of, of getting a patent. If you don't, then you jump into basically this Alice second test, so does it lead to something significantly more? But might be more difficult to prove that un unless you can show this practical application. So, okay, this is too small to read, but this is basically, you can, you can check it in the material. This is the Alice test with the new two-prong shows that's the Alice kind of a first step, that's the two, two prong test, and then that's the Alice, Alice second step. That's the, according to the basically guidelines, what the USPTO would, would start using. I think they're still, it's still open to comments, so we'll see if it still changes. Another thing is, uh, okay, well, yeah, I'll jump soon, but, so recommendations on this is, is that, uh, you know, these this guidelines or these this new guidelines, what it shows is, is this kind of non-exhaustive list of examples of abstract ideas. And then it has some examples of practical application, and those are listed here. So, you know, for example, uh, treats a particular disease or medical condition, you know, is implemented into a machine. So there's some examples given what 
could be a practical application. So I think that's again helpful because at least it gives you some ideas, okay, how can you maybe argue that in fact your it's not merely just an abstract idea, but it's actually a practical application using the abstract idea. So what applicants should now highlight is try to think of what is the practical application. And again, if once, while doing that, you have a better chance of getting a, getting a patent in the US. And, and what the guidelines also say, which help is that the practical application does not need to be novel or, or obvious. You just need to have it. I'm oh, sorry, novel or non-obvious. Non yeah. Another thing that, that I think relates to AI inventions is what they also added was guidance on, on this, their section 112F, which relates to functional claiming. Those, those dealing with computer implemented inventions, so this is very common. If you go to AI, you know, you're not going to have physical building blocks but it's, it's, it's a computer program, so very often you have to claim it by functional language. And, and that in the US, uh, especially if you have these means or steps, then you trigger this something called 112F. And, and uh, now in the new, new guide, guidance, they also say that, well, you could have other words that trigger this as well, such as, you know, me mechanisms for, module for, etc. And what the guidance says, when, when you have such a claim, then you have to keep in mind that you have to disclose an algorithm. So how, how can you implement it? So the problem is that in AI, very often you have to do these functional claims. When doing that, you have to pay attention to the fact that, as, as Mika also said, you have to really describe the invention in the description so that the skilled person can implement it. And, and that's what, so you, you then have to make sure that you have described kind of an algorithm, so how can you actually implement it? And, and you know, this can be done using mathematical formula, flowcharts, etc., or a combination of this. And, and the problem is, if you fail to disclose this, then you're not going to get a patent. So that in, in that sense, as also Mika said, important with AI mentions is not just what the invention is and how you claim it so that it's technical, but you also have to make sure that you have in the description described enough so that uh, a skilled person could, could implement it. So with the help of flowcharts, mathematical formula, etc. Uh, then, <coughs> small comparison at, at the end uh, of other countries. So we have just discussed EPO and USPTO and if this is Japanese office, Chinese office, Korea, and, and India. And, and as Mika mentioned, pretty much all of these others are, on one hand, very close to the European approach, is that they emphasize this. It has to be a you know, technical idea. Uh, is a technical problem solved? Are technical means used? You know, is a technical effect achieved, like, like in, in China? Uh, but then, in determining inventive step, that's where I think EPO is different, as we just discussed. They only look at the technical elements in regarding inventive step. These other countries don't say it directly, but my take, especially in the U well, I didn't put it here, but in the U.S., if you, if you overcome the 101 hurdle, they will look at the claim as a whole. They will not overstrike any elements. Same is in the Japanese office. They, they don't say it directly, but what's interesting, they, you can find it on the web. There's something called a patent examination handbook. It's very extensive what the Japanese office have, has done. J just the section on uh, inventive step is 151 pages. But they just added last week AI-related examples, and those are very helpful. You, I put here in the, in the inventive step section, they are around, let's say, examples 30 to 36, so at the end. And when you look at those examples, you'll see that they will look at the claim as a whole. They will not do it the way the EPO does. And that's, I think, very interesting. There's also a section on, on what Mika discussed on, on this, like, uh, description requirements. They also there provide AI-related examples. Also there, I think it's at the end sometime, around examples 46 forward if, 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 if you want to look at it. 
So that's, uh, I think, yeah, that's what I would say on, on, on the comparison, basically. That, yeah. Some differences and, and some inequalities, yeah. So at the end, my, my final slide conclusions, you know, include technical elements in claims, uh, and you should try to direct your uh, claims to, to a technical application. If you can do that, you, you are successful. And then, as I discussed, this technical problem. Try to identify the technical problems, and it could be AI-related or something else. But, as we discussed, the inventive steps should be found in the technical elements at the EPO. Uh, mathematical methods are considered in evaluating inventive step when applied to a specific technical application. That's helpful. And in the U.S., again, you have to find this practical application. And, again, you, you should describe algorithms. Thank you. Any questions to Volker? Please raise your hand if any at this stage. I think that, that during the last two sessions we dived to the very deep end, the patent end of the pool. But now there is one question. Please state your name and the organization you represent. Thank you. Uh, this is Wille Steutle from Steutle Intellectual Engineering. Hi, Volke. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I would like to quickly come back to a case you mentioned, and I think it was also in, in Mika's presentation. You mentioned this case with heartbeat detection and the neural network bringing there some, some uh, inventiveness. Uh, maybe it was presented a bit too, too brief, but but to me, it was, was unclear that is just the application of a neural network seen as, as bringing something new, or was there some, some, uh, something else more in line with your, your uh, more elaborate view on the EPO updates? Yeah, good, good question. So that, yeah, I had one on the slide. That, that was directly from the guidelines. So unfortunately, there's no real example or case law relating to that, the, the, the heartbeat example as far as I, I understand, or, or do, well, maybe Mika knows, but, but that's all they stated in, in the guidelines. My, so my take from that is that they consider that, that they are related to a technical application, and that's why, why they could allow it. I mean, yeah, that's about all they say, <laughs> what I had on the slide here. 